Our sermon text this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 35 through 39. Hear now the word of the Lord. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Gracious and holy God, I pray now that you would pour your Holy Spirit through me, that these words might truly become your living word to your people. And I pray that you would open up each of our hearts and minds that we might receive that word exactly in the place that we need to hear it. For we pray this in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. What are you looking for? These are the first words of Jesus recorded in the Gospel of John. What are you looking for? Such a simple question, isn't it? And yet surely it is one of the most profound questions in all of life. Have you ever really asked yourself what it is that you are looking for in life? And would you even know it if you found it? Now, I suspect that most of us go through life operating under the assumption that we already know what it is that we're looking for. After all, we live in a society that is constantly telling us what we should be looking for. Popularity, success, beauty, youthfulness, Wealth, power, privilege, rights, virility, a close, comfortable shave, a good, low-calorie beer, a six-pack, an online audience to applaud absolutely everything that we and our children do in life. I think that most of us just sort of accept this without serious reflection because it's practically the air that we breathe. But how often do we really step back and think critically and spiritually and biblically about what it is that we are looking for and about the answers that we are being force-fed by the culture around us? I think Jesus' question in our text this morning gives us the opportunity to do precisely that. Now, John the Baptist knew what he was looking for. He was a man on a mission. And he would go down to the Jordan River every day, offering the people a baptism of repentance in preparation for the one that all Israel was looking for, who would be revealed by the Holy Spirit. Now, John himself was a rather impressive fellow. He was confident, passionate, fiery, just like a prophet right out of the Old Testament. He was a spectacular preacher, drawing huge crowds that hung on his every word. John was clearly someone who had been touched by God. 
And all the crowd began wondering, maybe even hoping, that he was the one that they had all been waiting for, the Messiah who would redeem Israel and usher in the kingdom of God. Must have been a tempting role to play, don't you think? After all, popularity and adulation can be such heady things. But John was quite clear about his own identity and his purpose, and he knew that he was not the Messiah. He was but the voice of one in the wilderness crying out, prepare the way of the Lord. And so one day when John was down at the Jordan River, Jesus came along to be baptized And as Jesus was coming out of the water, John saw the Holy Spirit descend on him like a dove and remain there. And in that moment, John knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that he had found what he had been looking for. And he began to tell anyone who would listen, this is the guy I've been telling you about, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So the next day, John goes back to that same place where he had seen Jesus before, but this time he brings two of his disciples with him. And sure enough, Jesus walks by again, and John says, Look, here is the Lamb of God. And his disciples leave John and begin following after Jesus. Now this could not have been easy for John watching his own disciples abandon him for another teacher. But again, John was clear about who he was, and he knew what he was looking for. He also knew what his disciples were looking for, even if they did not know it yet. So John's ego was not at stake here. He was but a humble, obedient servant fulfilling his mission. So he took his disciples with him. He went back to the place where he himself had encountered Jesus. And when the Savior came by again, John pointed to him and then got out of the way. This is fundamentally what it means to be a witness, by the way. And be a witness is not about proving our faith or about arguing people into being Christians or into agreeing with all of our theology. It's about bringing people to the places in our lives where we have encountered Jesus and then pointing them in his direction, whether it be through worship, or through studying scripture, or by going on a cross-cultural mission trip around the world where many people have experienced the presence and the power of Jesus in incredible ways. But be very sure, Jesus does not just hang out in third world countries. No, he's particularly fond of hanging out in ordinary places, like classrooms and doctor's offices, and playgrounds, and dinner tables. He loves to hang out with children, and with the elderly, with those who are unpopular and unpolished, and with those who are on the margins of society. Jesus loves to get up early and visit with people in morning devotions, and he still likes coming to worship, even though The church has often forgotten what it is looking for, chasing after relevance and coolness and success like a a stray dog at a whistling convention. And yet, Jesus still promises us that whenever two or more are gathered in his name, he will be there among us. And every time we encounter him, he just keeps asking us the same question he asked these two disciples. What are you looking for? Now, I suspect that 
they were looking for the same thing that most of Israel was looking for, a military king who would defeat their enemies and make them feel safe. After all, they had been kicked around and conquered by one superpower after another for centuries. And now it was the the hated Romans who controlled them. And so the Jews were looking for a sense of autonomy and security. And we can understand that, can't we? After all, we too want to feel that we and our families are safe and secure. And we'll even go to great lengths to achieve that. Especially in a world that is feeling less safe and secure all the time. And not that there's anything wrong with that, per se, but the problem comes when when our actions to achieve this are driven solely by fear and self-interest, rather than compassion and obedience. Because fear causes us to think and act in ways that are not compatible with the gospel and with Jesus' commandment to love our neighbor as ourselves. Over and over in Scripture, we are told not to be afraid because God is with us. And therefore, we can always be assured that any voice out there that's trying hard to make us all very afraid, especially of another group of people, is not a messenger of the Lord. God's perfect love casts out fear. It doesn't incite it. And the truth is, our security is never really going to be found in things like a bigger military or taller walls or more weapons or better locks on our doors. But only through the fact that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and he's given us the power of his own spirit and has promised to be with us always, putting our ultimate trust in anything other than that is idolatry. Of course, Martin Luther once said that security is our greatest idol. And yet, Jesus never promised to keep us safe. He didn't say, follow me as long as there are not any risks involved or as long as it doesn't cost you anything. Rather, he said that we had to stop clinging to our lives if we wanted to save them. He commanded us to take up our crosses and follow him. And only then will we discover the life that we were created for, the life that we're all longing for. Now be very sure, if what you are looking for in this life is security, then you need to look somewhere other than Jesus. But I'm telling you, you're never going to find what you're looking for. But maybe maybe what you're really looking for are answers to some of your questions. Maybe you just can't rationally figure out how this whole faith thing is supposed to work. And so your unanswered questions are getting in the way, preventing you from going deeper. Questions like, how can Jesus be God and still a human being? Or how to, how to faith and science fit together? Or, or why does God allow bad things to happen in our lives? Or, or, or why doesn't God always answer our prayers the way we want him to? Or, or what is heaven really like and, and, and where is it for that matter? Or maybe you're wondering where Jesus is because you can't seem to find him anywhere even though others don't seem to have as much trouble. And so maybe what you really want to ask like these other two disciples is Rabbi, teacher, where are you staying? Or perhaps a better translation, where are you abiding? Where is it that you hang out, Jesus? Where can we find you when we need your help and your healing touch and your forgiving grace that has the power to make all things new? Where do you abide, Jesus? But in response to all of these questions, Jesus simply turns and says, come and see. 
You want answers to your questions? Then walk with me, and you will find what you are looking for. See, we don't get the answers to all of our questions and the Google Maps directions up front and then decide whether we're in or out with Jesus. Rather, he invites us to come with him and discover the answers along the way. Because the truth about God and the truth about ourselves can only be found through an ongoing relationship with Jesus as he continues to reveal more of God to us and more of what it means to be truly human. But that can only happen if you commit yourself to following Jesus wherever he leads you and hanging out in the places where he abides. But again, Jesus will never force his way into your life. Instead, he just invites you to come and see, and then he keeps moving. And you have to decide whether you are going to go with him or continue your search elsewhere. In the words of Henry Blackaby, There comes a time in each of our lives where merely talking about the Christian pilgrimage is not sufficient. We must actually set out on the journey. We can spend hours debating and discussing issues related to the Christian faith, but this means little unless we actually step out and follow Christ. These disciples had many questions filling their minds they longed to ask. However, Jesus did not engage them in theological discussion, but instead he just turned and began to walk. Their questions would not be answered through dialogue alone, but by walking with Jesus. For the Christian faith is is not just a set of teachings to understand, it is a person to follow. And as they walked with Jesus, those disciples watched Jesus heal the sick, teach God's wisdom, and demonstrate God's power. They not only learned about God, they actually experienced Him. Truth is, you can go through your whole life learning about God and never actually know Him. But what God wants more than anything is for you to know and experience His his grace and His love and His power and His purpose for your life by walking through life with Jesus. And as you do, you will discover that what you have been looking for all along is the one who in Jesus Christ has come looking for you. And the good news of the gospel is that you have been found That's what your baptism proclaims. And if you will commit yourself to abiding with Jesus by becoming a more active part of his body, his family, the church, and by participating in Christ's mission in this world, whether it be in a third world country or right here in our own neighborhood, and by growing as Jesus' disciple through worship, and prayer, and studying his word, and obeying his command, then eventually you will find that being with Jesus is even more important to you than the answers to all of your questions. Because only in the presence of Jesus will you ever be truly alive. But if you want to experience this, If you want to find what you are truly looking for, well, you've got to come and see.